Good morning, everyone. We are with you today uh, at the first Media Freedom Rapid Response webinar uh, titled MFRR in Focus. And today's topic is press freedom crisis in Slovenia. Uh, the Media Freedom Rapid Response, and uh, including with all partners, will be holding uh, the first of a new program. Uh, this is going to be a monthly webinar uh, where we will provide a snapshot of the state of media freedom across the EU member states and uh, candidate countries. And we will be highlighting our uh, organization's work defend, uh, defending independent journalism and pluralistic media. Uh, there will be speakers from different MFRR partner organizations, uh, and they will be providing news updates on the biggest press freedom stories of 2021 today. And uh, today, uh, there are uh, with us uh, uh, representatives from the ECPMF, uh, International Press Institute, Free Press Unlimited, uh, European Federation of Journalists, uh, OBCT, Article 19, and uh, uh, finally, uh, European Center for Press and Media Freedom. Our first speaker will be Antje Schlaff, who is coordinating uh, the further development of mapping media freedom and uh, is also analyzing our data regarding statistics. She will now give you an overview about some key statistics today. And please uh, go ahead, Antje. Thank you, Gilkam. Yeah, also for me, a warm welcome to the webinar. I will share my screen one second. So um, I will present you some uh, key statistics from Mapping Media Freedom. Um, Mapping Media Freedom is the platform where we document violations against press and media freedom. While, um, yeah, and um, we do this in a very detailed and comprehensive manner. And this, this um, allows us to provide you some statistics. Um, within our MFRR project, we focus on European member states and candidate countries. And I will show you some key statistics about these. Altogether on our platform, we have nearly 6,000 um, incidents, we call them alerts, um, since 2014. And um, only this year for European member states and candidate countries, we have 399 incidents recorded. This data is from last Thursday, so now it's uh, 405 alerts already. And we have more than 700 attack persons or entities related to media. So within one attack, several persons can be attacked. So for example, being at a um, demonstration and being uh, verbally and uh, physically attacked at the same time for several um, journalists. So what type of attacks do happen? Um, we have different type of, uh, of attacks happen. They might also happen within the same incident, one out of five incident um, media actors were physically attacked. We also monitored 32 incidents where media actors got injured. So this is 8% of our documented incidents where media actors got injured do doing their work. Um, the majority of incidents so um, contain verbal attacks. We have 176 alerts where people get verbally attacked. This includes in in intimidation, threatening, insult, abuse, harassment, as well as bullying, trolling. We also monitor um, attacks to property. So this includes equipment, personal belongings, but also attack to other property like cars or houses, as well as hacking. Um, in nearly one out of four incidents, media actors face legal consequences. And we also documented several attacks uh, regarding censorship. Um, what sources of attacks do we have? So who do, which entities perform these attacks? So due to our comprehensive categorization of our incidents, we can tell you this. The main source are private individuals. So this, they make up more than 40% of the attacks we documented but followed by police and state security, but also by governments and members of parliament or public officials and judiciary. And if we take state related uh, entities such as police, uh, government, judiciary or public authorities together, they also make up nearly 40% of our text documented. This is a worrying trend. Um, Regarding context, we also document where do these attacks happen. We have several contexts, but these are the most important ones. Um, we had 
lots of attacks happen during protest. It's 29% uh, of the attacks happen during protests. And um, also, um, we have also very frequent attacks happening online digital. So this is hacking, but also online threatening, online harassment. And this is a number which became higher in 2021 uh, compared to last year. So last year we had about 10% and now it's already 16% of online investment and so on. And COVID-19 is also a very important topic. We also monitor this. We had 105 attacks related to COVID-19. So more than one out of four incidents um, were related to COVID-19. So the main attacks happened during protests against anti-COVID uh, measures, um, but um, there were also laws restricting press and media freedom or people, um, journalists not uh, being able to go to a press conference, uh, several things brought up under the umbrella of COVID-19. This is all from my side. The, uh, these are the main key statistics. Um, if you want to know more, go to mappingmediafreedom.org or if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you so much, Antje. And uh, we are going to be turning back to you in the coming weeks uh, with in the updates on these numbers. And also, we would like to announce our uh, viewers that in the coming days, we will be announcing new, new numbers uh, based on what has happened until the end of September uh, in our newsletter. And uh, our next speaker is uh, the policy and advocacy officer from the Pre Free Press Unlimited, uh, Hushe Somer, who is working on safety of journalists. And uh, Hushe, please uh, update us on what has happened in 2021. Unfortunately, this year we have had already two journalist murders. So uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gurkan. Thank you for this introduction. And good morning, everyone from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, indeed, as Gerkan mentioned, I would like to uh, talk briefly about our very serious concerns regarding the safety of journalists uh, within the European Union, as already two investigative journalists were killed this year. Um, I'm talking about the Greek investigative reporter Georgios Karaivas, who was shot dead on his way home from work in April 2021, as well as uh, the Dutch crime journalist Peter Erdevries, who was um, shot in the head here in the city center of Amsterdam in July 2021. Um, the horrible killings of Karaivas and De Vries to us confirm a worldwide trend that journalists who work to shed light on abuses through their investigations and in doing so um, call perpetrators to justice are increasingly becoming victims of targeted violence. Uh, this trend that is connected to corruption and drug related as well as financial crime is threatening media freedom in the European Union. And therefore, we uh, believe that it can only be stopped by joint European efforts in these areas. I would like to share a little bit more um, with you on the killing of Peter Erdevries, the most recent killing. Um, many details behind the murder of De Vries are still unknown as the authorities are currently investigating the case. But an important detail is that um, the Office uh, of Public Prosecution has suggested a link to De Vries' role in the so-called Marengo trial, uh, which is a criminal case against leading members of a criminal organization involved in drug trafficking here in the Netherlands. So De Vries has been acting as an advisor to the key witness whose lawyer had actually been killed um, almost two years ago in 2019 as well. However, although Peter R. de Vries seems to have been murdered because of his advisory role in the criminal process, he had been receiving threats for years related to his journalistic work about organized crime. And he was placed under police protection um, or special police protection, I must say. So zooming out, uh, we, one can distinguish a broader trend within the Netherlands uh, with threats and harassments of journalists being on the rise. Um, so De Vries' killing therefore has a very chilling effect, uh, you could say, on the freedom of expression within the country and across Europe, especially because uh, the Netherlands was until 2021 ranked in the top five of RSF's uh, press freedom index. And its safety protocol called Persveilig has often been uh, presented as a good practice example. Um, therefore, uh, the, the MFRR partners have published several statements 
uh, about these two killings, so both Caraivas and Peter R. de Vries, in which we express our concern, our very serious concern about the impact um, that these killings have on press freedom in Europe. Um, threatening journalists deeply impact the freedom to report on crime, on political affairs and on other matters that are of public interest, uh, and it may lead to self-censorship. Um, looking forward, I think in the coming months or in the coming period, what is crucial is the search for justice. Um, since the murder of Caraivas, although the Greek authorities have announced an investigation, uh, no results have been presented yet. And concerning De Vries, it is encouraging to know that the Dutch authorities have announced new measures to improve the safety of journalists in the Netherlands. And also they have arrested two suspects um, soon after the assassination. But however, as for instance, the search for justice for Daphne Caruana Galizia has shown, it is uh, often um, more challenging to find the masterminds behind such assassinations um, and to bring them to justice, uh, to bring them to court. Um, so in the coming period, this will be the main challenge and us, the MFRR partners, will, uh, we will continue to closely monitor the cases and to make sure that justice will be served. Thank you, Gerkan. Thank you so much, Shushi, for this detailed uh, analysis of the situation. And uh, obviously, physical assault and uh, murder of journalists is not the only thing that is targeting journalists uh, in Europe, but also uh, online safety of journalists is an important aspect. And in order to give further details about this, I would like to welcome on stage now the communications and project officer from the European Federation of Journalists, Camille Petit, uh, who is now going to talk to, uh, talk about the Pegasus spyware scandals. And uh, Camille, uh, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Gerken. Good, mo good morning, everyone. Um, indeed, one, one other highlight of the summer was what we call the, the Pegasus scandal, uh, which was revealed by the French uh, NGO um, Forbidden Stories uh, in mid-July. So what's Pegasus in a nutshell? Um, Pegasus is the name of a spyware that was developed by the Israeli surveillance company um, NSO. Uh, uh, this spyware uh, has the specificities to allow access to all data when it's installed on a phone, uh, including audio, video, uh, locations, so basically all your life, um, without any activation or click uh, required from the phone user. Um, so officially, uh, according to NSO, uh, the spyware was designed to fight against terrorism and, and crimes. Uh, but forbidden stories discovered uh, thanks to leaked records um, that the original use of the malware has been abused um, and diverted from uh, its purpose uh, because they found that at least 180 journalists um, in 20 countries had their phones uh, infected. And one of these countries uh, is Hungary, where there is evidence that the Hungarian government uh, illegally surveilled at least six journalists. Um, so what does this tell us? Um, first of all, it's a serious threat to the targeted journalists, um, to their safety, to their privacy, uh, for them and for their sources. And second of all, um, it means that cyber surveillance uh, tools are not sufficiently regulated within the EU. Um, there is not enough uh, safeguards for these technological weapons that can target actually any EU citizens. And here there is a, a democratic um, issue. So as Media Freedom Rapid Response, um, we reported um, all the cases of the targeted journalists in Europe um, on mapping media freedom uh, that was presented by, by Ange earlier. Um, so it, this includes um, the French and Belgian journalists actually were also targeted uh, on the European soil, um, allegedly respectively by Morocco and Rwanda authorities, in addition to the Hungarian journalists I just mentioned, uh, being spied by, by their own uh, government. So what can we do and what can the EU do? Um, so we as MFRR, um, we provide practical support to journalists and in particular, um, one of them is cybersecurity tools and trainings, uh, because even if it's not a new issue, I mean, we, we were providing this before the Pegasus scandal, but this story really tell us again that there is, it's more in, than important that for journalists to, to take care of his, her, uh, digital safety and to protect him or herself as well as the sources. Um, at the European level and in all 27 member states, um, we absolutely need to implement regulations uh, that would protect journalists and citizens from illegal civilians. Um, there is a new 
EU export control, actually, which came, in, which came into force at the beginning of September. Um, and among other things, it aims to strengthen um, controls on the international uh, trade of so-called dual-use cyber surveillance tools. So we urge the, the, the EU member states to swiftly implement this important uh, regulation. And of course, we absolutely need an independent uh, investigation uh, into the Hungarian authorities um, to, to identify also the extent of the use of the Pegasus uh, spyware, uh, whether more people were targeted and, uh, and sanction actually any, any abuse. So that was a, a quick update on, on the Pegasus scandal. Um, I'll put some links in the chat to our alerts and statements uh, if you'd like to, to have more information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camille. And uh, the next topic on our agenda is state capture. And specifically, we would like to look into the case of Poland, the Lex TVN. And for this, uh, we are turning to the International Press Institute's Head of Europe Advocacy and Programs, Oliver Monique uh, And uh, Oliver, please, this stage is yours. Yes, good morning, Gurkan. Thank you very much. Um, look, so, so Poland, um, they've had a, a busy summer. The, Law and Justice Party um, have been trying to force through an amendment to the broadcasting law that would effectively force um, the, the, the largest independent broadcaster, TVN, uh, to for the US owners of TVN to sell its majority stake if it is passed. So on August 11th, uh, the bill was put before the session, the lower house, um, where it was passed after a very raucous debate and splits with between the PIS and the and, and the coalition, uh, the governing coalition parties. But it was passed by a slim majority and went up to the Senate um, on uh, September the 10th. So a month later, the Senate rejects the bill where PIS did not have a majority in the Senate. They rejected the bill and sent it back to the lower house, where it has been waiting for the last few weeks, and we're expecting it to be to be voted on again at any moment. We're not quite sure um, why there have been a delays, but assuming that that vote does take place and assuming that it is one, the bill would then go to up to the president, Andre Duda, to be uh, signed into law. Um, now, interestingly, Duda has in the last few weeks himself been expressing concern about the impact of the bill, particularly on its relations with the United States. And there is speculation, therefore, that, that Duda, despite being a PIS uh, member and presidential uh, representative, uh, that he may, he may veto the law. Um, so what is the Lex TVN law? Well, what it does is it amends the broadcasting law to ban um, companies based outside of the European economic area from owning a, a controlling stake or more than 51% of a media company in Poland. And this would effectively force the US company to sell its controlling stake. Now, PIS present this law as an effort to prevent countries such as Russia or China from getting influential uh, stakes of Polish media. But in, in practice, um, it's not Russian or Chinese companies that, that will be affected, it's the US uh, Discovery Channel. Um, so that's the situation. Now, why is TVN24 be, being targeted? Well, TVN24 and its most popular uh, news programme, Facti, are one of the sort of few remaining very popular independent news programmes uh, in an environment that is other, that has largely been taken over by pro-government quasi-propaganda uh, channels in Poland, particularly since uh, the PIS election 2015, when it instigated uh, changes to the state broadcaster Telewizja Polska, um, and forcing so forcing uh, uh, t uh, the US discovery to to sell at stake would provide an opportunity for allies of PIS to purchase uh, controlling uh, interest in the company to change its editorial line, and the first and the company uh, this is not so, not. Um, such an unrealistic um, expectation, given that uh, the company most likely to, to play that role would be the country's, Poland's largest um, energy giant, PKN Orlen, which last year decided it was necessary to uh, diversify its business portfolio and start taking making purchases into the media, uh, in, in, into the media um, sector. Um, so last December, it purchased the, um, the large regional media company, Polska Press, from the German 
uh, Verlars Group at Passau, which gives it access to the 20 uh, regional dailies and 500 online portals, portals and um, 120 local, mag uh, local magazines. Now, what you might ask is, um, an, is an energy giant doing um, investing in media? Well, that's a very good question. But what we do know is that since the post of Polska Press, there's been an editorial purge um, across the country. And this purge has been taking place despite, despite efforts by the country's then uh, human rights ombudsman, Adam Bodner, to, to launch a complaint through the Polish courts which led to the um, temporary suspension of the deal while it is being reviewed. The complaint is based on the question of the impacts um, of the purchase on media pluralism uh, in the country, Bodner making the case that it um, serious um, negative impacts on, on media pluralism. Now that, that case is still being played out in the courts and we do not expect it eventually to, be, to, to prevent the purchase. What we do know is that in the meantime, Peak and all and has instigated quite quite serious editorial uh, chain changes. Um, now, um, since this law has been uh, going through Parliament, we there is there is expect speculation that the country or the government has come under quite serious um, lobbying from the United States, and therefore the, there is speculation that. Um, eventually the PIS may be looking for some form of face saving exit from the crisis and that is also why um, there is a suggestion that Duda may well be looking for, uh, may well veto the law in order to be able to um, extricate themselves from this otherwise uh, dispute with the United States. So that's what that's what we're looking, we're hoping for. However, we cannot rely on that and this is um, we have to underline the seriousness of the situation that should the law pass and should the US Discovery Channel be forced to, to, to sell its state, then this would be a very serious uh, victory for PIS and its efforts to, to, to squeeze out um, independent journalism uh, in Poland. Thank you so much, Oliver. And uh, this is, was a very good summary of uh, the situation. And in the next newsletter, we will be going further into detail of this uh, situation. But uh, due to time, uh, our time limitations right now, we would like to go on to the OBCT's uh, coordinator of the Resource Center on Media Freedom in Europe. Uh, please welcome Paolo Rosa to speak about the uh, Italian criminal defamation reforms. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gorkan. Yeah, finally, a good news, we could say, but uh, in my short presentation, I'll try to highlight also the, ba the bad news uh, in, uh, inside the good news. Well, uh, let's start with the good news. In June of this year, the, constitutional, the Italian Constitutional Court abolished the Article 13 of the press law, which uh, compelled the judges to condemn uh, journalists to prison if uh, they had the crime of uh, defamation through the press with uh, accusation of fact. Well, prison remains as a possible punishment for uh, defamation only in uh, severe cases, including uh, cases of hate speech and uh, incitement to violence. So in this decision, the, the Constitutional Court wanted to balance the right of uh, freedom of expression with uh, the um, constitutional granted right of defending one's reputation. So on one side, journalists can be happy because this decision came thanks to um, a lawyer who was defending a journalist in two trials in Bari and Salerno uh, five years ago. So it took some time. The first ruling of the Constitutional Court was one year ago. That's why we can't uh, see it as a fully uh, good news. As the Constitutional Court in June 2020 stated that um, the parliament uh, should uh, tackle this issue and should proceed to a comprehensive reform of press, uh, the press law and the press uh, and the articles of the penal code uh, related to, to press. But it took one year, the parliament did nothing. And that's where the MFRR can 
can intervene maybe with uh, our advocacy activity, with our analysis, with our monitoring, because uh, as um, it has been stated from the colleagues as well, um, states are um, often enemies to press freedom. Uh, an example in, in this, um, in this uh, situation of the decision of the Constitutional Court is uh, that the government, the Italian government, submitted an opinion to the decision to, before the, the Constitutional Court ruled. And in its opinion, the government affirmed that uh, uh, defamation should remain as it is punished with the prison. This was an officially paper um, given to the Constitutional Court, while in the uh, meetings with the Italian Federation of Journalists, the government stated that they wanted to reform laws and to defend uh, freedom of the press. So these contradictions allow, these contradictions just force uh, us to intervene, to advocate, uh, and uh, to continue monitoring the situation not uh, believing to the good news only. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Paola. Uh, well, at least uh, there is a bit of good news uh, in today's webinar. And uh, the next uh, in our program is uh, Barbara Strukel and her interview. Uh, she is the editor-in-chief of the Slovenian Press Agency. So uh, we are now going to uh, watch uh, her interview. And I will be then passing my uh, floor to Jamie Weissman, uh, the IPI Advocacy Officer for Europe. Jamie? Thanks, Gökhan. Um, yeah, as we've heard, you know, there are serious issues facing independent media across the EU right now. And, and one of the flashpoints that we haven't really mentioned so far uh, is in Slovenia, uh, a country which for a long time was considered a relative safe haven for media. Um, but right now, um, there's a lot of issues involving the Slovenian press agency, which this year marked its 30th anniversary. Uh, it's really not been a year to celebrate, though, and for more than 270 days now. Uh, the agency has been out without state funding, um, guaranteed to it under two separate laws. Um, and this means uh, that you know, if some form of funding is not reinstated immediately, the STA could face insolvency uh, in a matter of weeks. Um, this would mean that 80 journalists would lose their jobs, um, and a central part of the country's media ecosystem could be silenced. Um, so yeah, to hear an update about what's happening at the STA, uh, we spoke with Barbara Sturiak, Editor-in-Chief of the Slovenian Press Agency. Hi, Barbara, and thanks for being uh, here with us for the first MFR in focus. Um, what is the latest situation at the Slovenian press agency and, and the situation with this director general? So um, yesterday, director general, Mr. Veselinovic uh, resigned uh, after turning down a draft public service agreement proposed by the government communications office, UCOM. Well, that uh, brought STA in another uh, uncertain position because we actually don't know how we will survive uh, next month. And um, the kind of how long the financial um, situation right now, how long will the money last until the agency faces financial collapse? Well, actually, the October is the, the last month that the agency will be able to pay the salaries uh, um, and uh, the payments for the uh, freelance workers. But uh, probably it will be not uh, able anymore to, to pay the obligations, uh, other financial obligations. So actually, we are really on the brink, on the br uh, on the verge of insolvency. Yes, and it's like a, a very dire situation. We've seen the warnings, of, obviously, from the, the unions as well. I mean, how is morale right now in, in the newsroom amongst the staff and the journalists? Well, it's really hard. Yesterday we had, uh, let's say, um, a meeting in the newsroom, and it was really emotional. Uh, we, we are not only facing uh, mass departures of the, of the journalist, um, let's say before this sad saga began, we have about uh, one leave 
per, per year uh, average, but now from the beginning of this year, we already lost like 10 journalists, which is approximately, I don't know, a 12% of the total workforce. And people are worried, unmotivated. There is a sense of apathy and desperation. So it's really not uh, a rosy atmosphere now in our newsroom. I guess, obviously, in the background, uh, these negotiations with the government communication office, um, how are they going? Has there been any progress made? Well, SDA and UCOM um, spent actually months. I think that the first negotiation round was in July uh, in discussing a public service agreement uh, that the government uh, says it's needed for uh, resumption of the public financing uh, of the agency. But uh, actually, not only that the agreement is not needed, since the, the two laws uh, uh, set uh, the legal basis for providing uh, a payment, but also uh, the draft of this agreement discussed by STA and UCOM proposed that the number of the news items and photos which are part of the public service is supposed to be built per piece every month, regardless of the complexity of the news, regardless of the amount. So this is something which is actually unacceptable from, from journalistic point of view, that your news are actually only pieces which are paid by the government. I suppose there are concerns here around the commercial and economic issues, but are there still concerns about STA's editorial and kind of management and independence as well? Of course, uh, because uh, one way is this, um, let's say, financial basis, which is actually um, not strong enough through this uh, through this uh, draft of this agreement uh, but uh, as we also said yesterday uh, at our uh, uh, newsroom meeting uh, we as journalists we cannot uh, accept this module of payment uh, to be to be paid per piece and uh, i think that the government uh, should uh, continue this uh, broader approach to the sta because it's not only a subscriber, it's also the owner and should have uh, a wider context of uh, having a national press agency, uh, because as you know, Slovenia is a very small uh, media market and uh, have a lot of difficulties. So the government as a representative of the founder, which is the state of uh, Republic of Slovenia, should have this broader aspect uh, in front when this agreement, if needed, uh, is uh, shape is shape it, shaped. I mean, like you said, you know, the, the situation now seems completely unprecedented. That we're now at the position where you know a national news agency in a member state of the European Union is on the verge of bankruptcy. I mean, in your view, what are the reasons that you know we've got to this stage so far along? Well, we we are not only desperate, but also disappointed very much because uh, also within EANA Group, uh, European News Alliance, uh, uh, we actually don't have the similar case. And uh, we also feel strong support from the EANA, but uh, what are the reasons? Actually, uh, if, we, if we look to the whole process, which is going on for almost uh, a year, we can see that the government often changed the narrative. Uh, what are the reasons and why should the, the uh, public uh, financing um, is uh, withdraw? So I think that uh, they, they try to actually gain control uh, over the STA and uh, maybe um, they didn't believe that we will hold for so long and now, um, due to this financial pressure, which is now so immense that we are really um, on, the, on the brink, um, is, I think, the latest uh, and the last milestone, which probably we will not pass. You said that you you'd kind of felt support from, from Ayana. Um, but the, what have you kind of judged from your position as editor-in-chief, the response from the European Union, European Commission, and its officials in this situation? 
Do you think they've done enough to kind of ensure that this contractual dispute is resolved and the funding um, recommences? Well, uh, I think that, uh, let's say, officials in the EU, or at least the one who, 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 who are in charge of, they have a fully understanding of the situation. And uh, yes, uh, of course, we, we, we feel that the strong support and we are grateful for, for it. But unfortunately, um, there is probably a lack of, uh, of, uh, of mechanisms which uh, could help the media, not only the SDA, because probably we are not the first and the last in, in such situation, that will help the media with some uh, very direct uh, help, you know, like maybe that the EU should think about the establishment of a special fund uh, which could help media in such position just to just to get over this this and uh, will later let's say the money will be returned or something because uh, I didn't mention that that SDA already um, launched court procedures uh, but we are afraid that all these procedures will will took too long uh, and we will not be alive anymore at the time when the court will uh, will decide uh, we are that we are sure that in our favor. Well, thanks very much for joining us. Um, we hope that the situation um, resolves itself very soon and uh, our organizations will continue to, to push to make sure that SDA's independence um, and its financial stability are ensured. So thanks very much. Thank you for the invitation. Bye. Thank you. Uh, the Editor-in-Chief of the STA there. Um, so to kind of discuss a few of these issues a little bit further and look in more depth at the situation for media freedom in Slovenia right now, uh, we're joined by Petra Tushek, president of the Slovenian Journalists Association, Lenard Kucic, uh, an investigative journalist at uh, the, the Slovenian media outlet Podsherto, and Renata Schroeder, director of the European Federation for Journalists. Um, Petra, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am with you, but I cannot start the video now because it's, it is written that it's unable to start. Maybe. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, and Lenard as well, we can see you? Okay. Uh, okay, now I'm with you with the video okay. as well. Great, let's jump straight in. Uh, Petro, I'll come to you first. We've just heard a quite concerning kind of update from, from the STR. Um, there seems to be so many issues for media freedom in Slovenia right now. And of course, this is happening while the country is heading the rotating presidency of the European Union. Um, from the perspective of your, your association, what are the, some of the other kind of key concerns right now um, for independent journalism? Uh, for journalist safety, and uh, particularly the, the public broadcaster as well. Uh, yes, uh, good day to everyone and thank you for the invitation as well. I would uh, rather be with you in some other circumstances, but um, unfortunately uh, months of uh, deterioration of media freedom are still going on and it's quite intense and still turbulent and I think it's uh, going to be uh, even worse. Uh, as we heard from Barbara Strukel from the Slovenian press agency, this is really the core problem in Slovenia at the moment. Um, and all the interpretations that the problem is uh, actually being solved and all the uh, manipulations of the government that uh, is trying hard to uh, conclude the contract is uh, just a misleading of public and trying to, to give the impression that the actual fault is actually on the uh, SDA part, uh, on the leadership and uh, of course on journalists as well. Um, what we are afraid of is that uh, this is um, just the first step uh, we are looking into it that after uh, and if the Slovenian press agency falls and uh, if the bankruptcy is really uh, the scenario we are going to face, that this is just the first media that uh, is going to be endangered and that uh, the path is then open also to the others. Uh, so um, journalists are really trying to work professionally as they can, but they are facing losses of journalists uh, already and they are weakened uh, so much that the severe pressure is then even, even harder than. Uh, we we uh, tried also with the donation campaign, uh, public really uh, helped and now um, that uh, we can see that the payment is not going to be uh, assured, we uh, 
again remembered people that the account at our association is still open but we're not going to do the same donation campaign because we believe that the public now thinks that the government has to do uh, what is uh, obligated by the law so that uh, people cannot take the uh, costs that have to be taken by the government. So we, we, we expect the government to pay and um, uh, we, we, cannot, uh, we cannot expect from the public to pay the, uh, the obligation of the state. Uh, as I was saying that we are afraid that this is just the first step um, we can also uh, notice that the pressures uh, upon uh, radio and television Slovenia, so the, uh, the core of public broadcasting is strengthening. Uh, uh, these attempts of uh, government to take the control under public uh, broadcasting is, uh, these are still in progress. Uh, we we um, have maybe a little bit good, good news in these processes that the uh, court, um, didn't agree with the latest uh, changes of two uh, members of the uh, surveillance board. Uh, so it stopped this procedure and uh, the, the appeal is not uh, possible in this way. So the court, um, the court is working. I believe that we are, we are somehow circulating with all these decisions that are made by government and then with the processes that are going on on court, uh, different court levels. Uh, what is uh, worrying in the case of a Slovenian press ag agency is that the time is not uh, really in favor of them because it, it is lasting too long. It, it, has, it hasn't been discussed uh, not even once uh, at the court about the the first payment for the estate for the for the January. So just for one one salary, just uh, uh, so that we see that this is really going very slowly. Um, what uh, can also be mentioned is that the wider hostile climate against journalists is really uh, problematic and it is still worsening. Uh, we can see uh, the protests are becoming. Um, also the questions uh, for the uh, security of journalists is being raised because journalists are attacked at the process by anti-vaxxers and uh, as, as you know, and you probably noticed, uh, there was also um, an attack in the TV uh, studio uh, lately. Uh, so they uh, broke into the, uh, the air TV studio. Uh, so we can, we can see these processes that the, um, security is more and more an issue uh, for the journalists as well. So what we were, we were, we were claiming last month and also what your mission uh, in Slovenia um, has uh, found out is that all these pressures, uh, all these attacks that were verbally, uh, harassments online, um, assaults and so on, it are really getting uh, materialized Form. So we can see that the step where someone uh, provokes someone, uh, so all the provocative and all the insulting uh, uh, manners of politicians are now moving into, 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 into practice. Uh, so this is what I think is uh, very problematic. We launched the platform where we register attacks on journalists, um, our association, and uh, there are already 24 cases just this year registered on the platform. These are just the cases that uh, the journalists uh, also consent and they are also ready to, uh, to report. So there are, there are many more others. So there are just those who we, uh, as estimate and also journalists uh, agree that uh, we um, uh, put on the platform. So I think that um, the international support of the community has really been important, but as Barbara stated, maybe it hasn't been enough. So the solidarity and all the help, all the warnings really helped us uh, to raise the awareness to, to see the case. But uh, I think that they are obviously not effective enough because we are now at the stage that some other moves uh, also from the politicians from the European Union should be, should be done. So combined with all the other changes in media landscape uh, that probably uh, Leonard can talk more about also about the ownership changes that are going on at the moment, especially in the print media, um, we can say that we are more vulnerable and fragile. We can be solider, but we maybe won't be solid enough if if we don't uh, give just have just not one solution. Maybe maybe something that give us uh, something to move with forward. 
Thanks so much, Petra. And um, yeah, Lena, I could just bring you in. Um, obviously, these kind of issues around STR, the public broadcaster, attacks on journalists uh, by anti-vaxxers are the most kind of visible and, and obvious cases, uh, threats to media freedom right now. But in your research, you kind of have looked a little bit behind the scenes. Um, so I wanted to ask you um, how this kind of issues around STR um, around you know government control over the public broadcaster fed into a kind of wider backdrop uh, of pluralism in Slovenia right now of government interference um, and what your research has kind of shown about these these topics. Uh, so you're muted, uh, and if you could just keep your intervention, uh, we don't have much time, just to a couple of minutes. Ah, uh, sure. I mean. <laughs> a lot to in. Um, I, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, those uh, things are mostly symptoms of uh, some broader stuff because uh, our investigation has shown that there are some systemic problems that are here since the independence and they go way across, you know, this left and right spectrum. Uh, every government has many options to abuse its powers to influence uh, or control the media in Slovenia. Um, so it has strong influence on the state and public state and I mean public and private media companies through uh, state-owned companies and public tenders. Then there's huge problem for using public money for political propaganda. Uh, there's really weak regulation that's unable to prevent media concentration. And there is absolutely no real protection from the new means of propaganda like astroturfing and social media smearing campaigns, etc. So uh, as we've seen in some recent example, um, astroturfing is a huge issue. Um, there is a political battlefield on social media and then the media system is reinforcing uh, this battlefield. Uh, there is increased influence of uh, foreign Hungarian made owners that are close to the ruling Hungarian party Fidesz. Uh, for example, uh, the second or, let's say, or third biggest commercial television planet TV has been uh, taken over by Hungarian company TV2 that belongs to the so-called pro Fidesz media circle. And uh, Hungarian investors also own pro SDS TV, Nova TV, and uh, there is some new activities on this uh, pro government media network. Um, then there are some other pressures, like um, some critical media um, lost some public funding for uh, their uh, activities. Uh, there are strong, let's say, suspicions that. Um, state advertising is being channeled to some media uh, outlets that are close to the political parties, there are slap cases, etc. And uh, as Petra also mentioned, um, maybe because of the crisis, maybe because the time is right, but uh, there's been a takeover of two important regional newspapers, Primorska Novica and Vichir, uh, and they allegedly became the part of a private media network that uh, includes uh, most of the magazine, press, commercial radio and TV stations, political magazines, etc. And uh, our investigation has shown that this network is problematic because it's operated through proxies to bypass media legislation and uh, to increase its media portfolio despite this anti-concentration clauses. And uh, yeah, in this political sense, they are considered not to be pro-government, but their activities are, are very problematic and states, well, nobody's doing anything to, to prevent it really. And we also seen some uh, already some, some cases of uh, censorship, for example, uh, in major national daily Delo. Uh, they reportedly removed a commentary about uh, literally from the printing press because it was critical to the government. Um, and uh, there it's just not the only such example when editors wanted to protect um, business interests of their owners, uh, which is also very problematic in Slovenia. Uh, but to sum up, um, this COVID crisis has really shown that um, party propaganda is I think has been using like the last a lot of resources uh, and last three years for spreading the message that there is no journalism, there is no media, there are no journalists, there are only leftist and rightist activists. And uh, as a consequence, well, there is declining public trust in the media, of course. And uh, as we've seen, you know, this rise of uh, anti-vax movements and strong hesitancy uh, for getting vaccinated, it's a probably has a strong correlation with this that the public simply, you know, after three years of uh, fierce propaganda battles over media, uh, simply doesn't trust media anymore. And uh, the consequences are dire, as Petra mentioned. There are more and more attacks on journalists during the protests. It can be either 
COVID protests or political protests. But but yes, I mean, it's really, um, it will be really hard, you know, because uh, the politics has been trying so hard to uh, dismantle every uh, possible trust uh, in the media to, to actually uh, give it back. And uh, as we know, it's crucial for every uh, society to, to function to has this basic trust uh, in the sources of information. Thanks, Leonard. Yeah, I think a really key point you mentioned there is that a lot of the kind of issues now we're seeing, uh, yeah, symptoms of, of weaknesses within the media market, whether that's around transparent, transparency or, you know, safeguards for independence of public broadcasters. Um, Renato, I want to give the last word to you here. Uh, the MFRR obviously held our, our mission to Slovenia uh, online in May and June 2021. What were some of the kind of key conclusions and what would your, your message be um, to, to stakeholders on the ground there about the STR and, and media freedom in Slovenia right now? Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Petra and uh, Nenad for, for your updates. Unfortunately, not very promising, um, but I'm not, I'm not surprised. I know there have been letters by the commission, there has been noise by us, there has been a lot of noise by all of you, and I would like to congratulate you again on your constant professional behavior, on the crowdfunding you have been doing, on trying to involve really the public at large, and I think we have all been oppressed that you in Slovenia are doing great. It is different than Hungary, it's different than Poland, we have been saying that. And from the mission I have attended, I also have to say, besides what Leonard said, that journalists are being put into the polarized societies, into right and left, there still is professional journalism. And that seems to be really reflected by STAR, by the public service media, which for that very reason is being utterly attacked at the moment. And I think, um, we need to get more attention from the European Parliament specifically. We will, we had already talks to them. You may know we have an advocacy mission on the ground in Ljubljana in, in three days and afterwards, we will talk to the European Parliament. We, the European Commission is aware that these letters don't work. That's why we are working on a Media Freedom Act, which has enforcement capabilities, which has teeth to make possible that something what has happened in Slovenia cannot happen in the future. We have seen it in Hungary, we have seen it in Poland, it hasn't worked. Slovenia seems to be going in a way in the same direction, even though it's not that bad there. So we need much more enforcement, we need much more acts. We will continue to join you there, we will be there, we will continue what we have been doing. But it's true that unless you have a change of government, it will be very difficult to change that. And, and there we still have hope. We know that there will be elections, but um, we need to do much more to save uh, public interest journalism at a larger scale, and that not only in Slovenia. And I know time is almost off, Jamie. So um, I stop here if you have another question. Go ahead. No, thanks. Thanks so much, Renata. Um, and like you said, yeah, the, the, the delegation from IPI, EFJ and the European Centre for Press and Media Freedom will be in Ljubljana on October 6th. So we'll be sure to raise all of these issues and more um, when we're there. Um, so thanks to Renata, thanks to Petra, thanks to Lena for joining us. And uh, I'll hand back to Gurkan. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you so much to our uh, panelists. And today we have been uh, leading the first episode of MFRR in focus uh, with the specific title of Press Freedom Crisis in Slovenia. Uh, today, the Media Freedom Rapid Response held its uh, first of a new program of monthly news webinars. Uh, we have been providing a snapshot of the state of the media freedom across EU member states and candidate countries. And aside from the MFRR partner representatives and panelists' speeches, in the past month there was also the uh, President of the European Commission, the, uh, Ursula von der Leyen's uh, State of the Union address, where she has uh, announced the recommendations for safety for journalists and the Media Freedom Act uh, for Europe. Uh, obviously, we will be following these uh, uh, developments and announcements uh, closely in the coming months. And uh, let us uh, close by uh, announcing that uh, on a monthly basis uh, from now, we will be airing uh, monthly news webinars, uh, podcasts, and also uh, we will be issuing newsletters. So uh, do not forget to sign up. And thank you for watching us. <laughs>